typically, this time of year, we like to spend our time looking at the crucifixion. And with Good Friday coming up and Easter Sunday, we turn our gazes toward the agonies of Jesus' crucifixion and we thrill in the joys of his resurrection. And that's good. Forget Easter. If, if only we all would spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating that. I mean, can you imagine what your walk with God would look like if you spent a whole hour every day considering the death and resurrection of Jesus? What, what it would mean to your life, what it would mean to the lives of those around you. It'd be amazing. But you know, today instead of, or maybe rather in addition to this, we're going to take some time to consider Jesus' other death. The death we don't usually remember. And this is a death that Jesus didn't really have to die, but he chose to anyway for us. And of course, if we consider his death, we must also consider his other resurrection. Now, it's true that in the Bible, there are very often parallels, and more often than not, they, they seem to be there deliberately. For instance, you've probably heard it said that the Bible begins in a garden and ends in a garden. From Eden to heaven, there are these bookends on our story, and, and each of them help us understand the other in, in ways that we may not have otherwise noticed. For, for what it's worth, there's a garden in the middle of the story as well, Gethsemane. And we've got these parallels. You can see them all throughout the scriptures. You know, early on in Genesis, we have the parallels of Abraham telling Pharaoh that Sarah, his wife, was his sister. And later, we have the exact same story again with Isaac, his son, and Rebekah and Abimelech. We have Jonah falling asleep on a boat in the middle of a storm. And later on, Jesus falls asleep on a boat in the middle of a storm. Elisha the prophet blessed 20 loaves of barley bread, feeding a hundred men and still had some left over. And Jesus, more famously, blessed five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 men and their families with, with 12 basketfuls left over. And so we reach this parallel as well, the other death of Jesus. One death is recorded at the end of his earthly ministry and the other at the beginning. Let's find it in Matthew chapter 3. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now John's clothes were made of camel hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey and people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And John said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me, comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And Jesus then came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. <laughs> and there it is, plain as day, the other death of Jesus. Now, now, maybe this can help if you're confused. Uh, Paul, in Romans uh, chapter 6, says this. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace, or that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. See, part of what Paul is saying there is that the ritual of baptism is a form of death. Not physical death, but a death to our sins. Death to our sinful nature. It's, it's a parallel of the crucifixion. Now obviously when Jesus was baptized, it wasn't yet known that it would become a symbol of his death and resurrection, since he had yet to die and rise again, but it was deliberate. It was an example for us to follow. It did make me wonder though, what meaning did the early Jews give to baptism? You know, apparently it was a fairly common thing, although it wasn't yet a symbol of following Jesus. And so what did it mean? 
You know, I did some digging and I managed to find some fascinating information on this. For the Jews, there were six different levels of acceptable areas for ritual washing, which uh, was the precursor to baptism. So starting at the bottom of the pile with the least desirable and working your way up, they were as far as I can tell. Number one, you could uh, do your ritual washing in a pit or a cistern of standing water. A little better than that was a pit that was refreshed by rainwater. Uh, higher than that is a custom-built ritual bath containing uh, 300 liters or more. And these were also known as mikvahs. Better than a mikvah were fountains. Better than fountains were flowing waters. And better than flowing waters were something they called living waters, where, which were like natural lakes and rivers. Now, these ritual baths for the Jews, they had a few different purposes. For the priests, the purpose was that they had to be ritually washed and ceremonially clean so they could serve in the temple, which was holy. For the average person, it was possible to become ritually unclean for a variety of different reasons. You know, touching dead bodies, having certain diseases, birthing children, uh, certain eating habits. Um, it, was, it was a long and exhaustive list. And for the average unclean person, after waiting for the allotted time, they were required to wash their entire body in fresh, ritually clean water. And after the temple was built, it was also required to wash in a mikvah, or custom-built ritual bath, before you entered the temple. The takeaway was that this ritual washing, or this, this baptism of sorts, uh, accomplished the result of making one ritually clean again. And thus, it allowed them to participate in holy activities and enter into holy areas. Now, the word mikvah itself is, is actually kind of interesting. In addition to being a custom ritual cleansing bath, the, the word was also used for pools of water, plenty of water, gathering together, linen yarn, and hope. And, and its root word, kava, can mean a binding together, a twisting, uh, looking, uh, patiently looking, and uh, waiting for something. Uh, in action, this word can be found in Jeremiah 17, for instance, where the prophet preambles by saying things like, Cursed is the man who, who trusts in man, who draws strength from his own flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He'll be like a bush in the wastelands, and they, and they will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where nobody lives. And it sounds like there's a serious lack of living water there. What's fascinating is that this is the curse on the man who trusts in himself and feels that he doesn't need the Lord. Now, contrasting with this, immediately afterward, Jeremiah describes the man who trusts in the Lord. He says, he's blessed. He's like a tree planted by the water with roots in the stream. It doesn't fear when the heat comes and its leaves are always green. It doesn't worry in years of drought and it never fails to bear fruit. Uh, can that be said of you and me, that we never fail to bear fruit? I mean, this is the man who trusts in God. Now then we have a few verses later, we, we see the word mikvah in action. Here it is. It says, Lord, you are the hope, which is translated from the word mikvah. You are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be ashamed. Ashamed is a different word, uh, bush, which, which can be translated dried out. So, Here's the thing, in the original Bible language, especially Hebrew, which is a poetic language, the Bible is actually full of puns. Now, some of them are funny, but many are deliberately used to enhance what's, what's trying to be said. And, and this is one of those cases. So you can read this as, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be ashamed. Or you can read this as, Lord, you are the abundant water of Israel. All who forsake you will be dried out. So the same word, which is also used to describe those custom-built ritual baths, the precursor to baptism, also helps describe God as the abundant water of Israel. Now combine that with the earlier verses about the dried out, self-sufficient man versus the man who trusts in God with his roots always in the water, and you start to get a clearer picture of what he's talking about. If you don't trust God, uh, if you prefer your own, uh, what you can do, your own works, you have no source of water and your life it shrivels away um, the, because the water brings life. One could say 
the water of life. <laughs> uh, if, however, you trust in God, your roots are in the streams, and you never cease to flourish, because the water brings life. In verse 13, we see that God is the abundant water of Israel. He is the water of life. In fact, when you think of abundant water, you think of sources that never dry out, like, like lakes and rivers. And, and this is the same with God. Uh, in the Jewish culture, those kind of replenishing waters were called living waters. So by the time Jesus came for the baptism of repentance of sins, it was a symbol of both washing away your impurities as well as dipping your roots into the water of life, being rooted constantly and deeply in God. Now, did Jesus need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins? No. He had no sins to repent for, but, but like his crucifixion death, he came anyway, for you and for me. Jesus came to show us the way. And Looking back on it, the Gospel writers found this to be extremely important, as, as this is one of very few things that is actually recorded in all four Gospels together. Now, today we've talked a little bit about Jesus' other death, and just like his crucifixion death alone, it's meaningful, but we shouldn't leave him in the tomb. So listen to this combo, this remix, combining Luke's account from chapter 3 and Paul's full explanation in Romans 6. It goes like this. It says, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died to sin has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that, um, so that you obey its evil desires. Don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, I know that many of you have been buried with Christ through baptism, dying to sin, but how many of us have been united to Jesus in resurrection uh, into a new life, alive to God? So in this season of remembrance, where we think back on Jesus' sacrifice, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, let's also think back to Jesus' first death his symbolic death in the waters, and let's join him there. You know, if you've never been baptized, I encourage you, give it some thought. Be born again and go through the waters. And if you have been through the waters, if you have died to sin, look back on it with fondness and remember, you are not the person that you used to be. You're new, you're clean, you're recreated, you're born again, you're dead to sin, you're raised to life, you're no longer under the law, you're under grace.